There are over 85 million men who are registered voters in the United States. And with the election just a week away, it's becoming glaringly apparent that this enormous constituency has been overlooked by both political parties. And I think it's time for that to end because I do believe that some of the issues I'm gonna talk about today are gonna to be the kinds of issues that shape our culture and our society and our economy over the next decade or two, especially if they're not dealt with. So today, I wanna to delve into politics just a tiny bit, just to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been talking about here on this channel and some of the things that you guys have expressed to me and see if we can start creating a consensus for how to communicate this to political leaders of both parties because I don't think this is a, um, a left thing or a right thing. I think it's a right thing and a wrong thing. And I think it's time that we start finding allies to uh, champion these causes because I think they affect everyone. And if we don't, I think the whole country's gonna pay a price for it in the long run. So the first issue I want to talk about are those issues that are affecting young guys. Because our young men today are facing more challenges and are fighting an uphill battle like we never had to. And it's only going to get worse because the problem appears to have been or appears to be progressive. It starts in primary school where the primary education system, for the large part, does not get a lot of male influence. Women have been running this system for a very long time. They've created primarily the education system that we have, and they manage it. And of course, it stands to reason, from a feminine perspective, if you are creating a system, you can only create that system using the information that you have on hand. And of course, we all draw from our personal experiences. So it stands to reason that this system would be created in such a way that girls and young women would be better suited to it. It's very clear that young men are struggling and some of the behaviors that come natural to young men are being punished in schools. Not to mention, now that we understand brain development much, much better, that the, um, the different rates at which men and women develop their intellect needs to be taken into account as well. So what ends up happening is fewer and fewer men or boys graduate from high school Fewer apply to college. Right now, only about 40% of the students who are uh, enrolled in colleges and four-year institutions are, uh, are men. So 60% now are women. And that's a number that has flipped over the last 50 years. Now, I'm not saying that fewer women should go. I'm just saying that this system is producing outcomes that identify processes that are failing young men. And fewer and fewer men are graduating from college at all. So with fewer and fewer men being well-educated in their 20s and 30s, they're finding it more difficult to get ahead financially. And that leads to their inability to find partners. Most women want to marry someone who is at least at the same social economic class that they're in. Very few want to marry a man that is making less money than they are. And I know that sounds sexist, but it's pretty much proven out to be true across the board. So that leaves a lot of young men single and unable to find a partner to begin their lives with. Um, and that pushes off then things like their first home purchase because when you're only trying to purchase a home right now with one income, it's very, very difficult. You need to have a two income household in most cases in order to afford to buy that first house. And if they're not meeting that girl 
and buying that house, well, they're certainly not having any babies. And our economy is sort of driven by that whole process. The formation of families and the purchasing, purchasing of real estate and the having children is what drives our whole consumer-driven society. I mean, without those elements, we're obviously going to see an enormous change in our economy. Our, gross domestic, our GDP, our gross domestic product, will be negatively impacted by those, by those factors. So this isn't just a matter of feeling sorry for a bunch of guys. There's a lot of self-interest in this for everyone. If we don't get this sorted out in a short order, we're going to see some significant changes to our economic prosperity as a country. As an aside, I think it's really important that we also talk about why is it we need two incomes to buy a house these days? When I was growing up, my family had one income, and we had a fairly nice middle-class life in the 1970s. Back in the 1950s and 60s, it seemed like everyone was pretty much living a pretty nice life on just one income. So why is it families now need two or even more incomes just to break even? We're not talking about getting ahead. We're not talking about stashing away tens of thousands or millions of dollars. No, we're talking about just living from paycheck to paycheck every, every month. Why is that happening? Who got all that money? Where did all the efficiencies go that came from automation and the digital age and computers? Where are all those promises that were kept, that were not kept? What's happened to all that money? I know where it's gone. Guys like Elon Musk and uh, you know the Amazon guy, and the big companies, multinational companies, who got all those tax breaks in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, they've taken it because they're not paying any taxes. There are no protections for labor any longer. And yeah, the rest of us are paying the price for it. So I think that's a, a huge issue that needs to be addressed. But I digress. The next issue that I think we need to talk about is one that affects guys like me. I am 59 years old and I am divorced. I have been divorced now for five years. They call it a gray divorce. And gray divorces, people age 50 or over, have tripled in the last two decades. That's an extraordinary trend and it's one that has gone largely unnoticed by society as a whole. And the implications of that are not really fully understood. So gray divorces hurt both parties to some extent, because obviously there's you know, economies of scale when you're sharing a home with someone. Because what you're doing then is you're taking an income that was you know, capable of supporting two people in one home and dividing it in two and trying to create two homes out of it. And it just doesn't work very well. And for people in their 50s and older, oftentimes they're dealing with health issues and disabilities and other problems that make it very, very difficult to start a new career or to get a job or to support themselves financially. And so these people end up being you know, dependent on, on the state social programs just to make ends meet. Again, this is a breakdown in, in the family. And a lot of it has to do with a reaction um, to divorce laws back in the 1970s. And believe it or not, it was Ronald Reagan in California who introduced the first no-fault divorce. And obviously because of all those movie stars that he was friends with who wanted to get out of their marriages so they could move on to the next you know, star or starlet, um, they made it very easy. Now, there were some terrible things that happened in some cases, and there's always these extremities that we talk about, you know, where women were you know, held prisoner or tortured or treated poorly by their husbands in ways that are unimaginable. But that's not generally the case. These days, because of no-fault divorces, because couples find themselves in situations where perhaps they're just not as happy as they would like to be, or, you know, they, um, they have that fear of missing out. They're thinking that maybe if they'd made a different choice earlier in life, they could do something different. And they get this dreaminess about them. And 
I think that media and social media certainly play a role in creating this idea that um, boredom or um, the challenges that come in a relationship are just not worth it. And I would argue that that is um, a problem that we need to address. And now I'm not saying that we need to go back to the time before the no-fault divorce, but I do think we need to do something that's more applicable to our current values so that getting a divorce is not a first option for a lot of people, you know? Um, especially if there has been no infidelity or alcoholism or drug addiction or violence or any of that stuff. If you're in a normal, healthy relationship and you're just having trouble getting along, we need to come up with some other way to help people through that time and um, maybe better prepare people for it before they even get married. But these gray divorces are another indication of the breakdown of sort of the, our, our family fabric. And when the family isn't there to support people and to help, help out family members, the only place these people can turn is to the state. And so our social programs are gonna become more and more overburdened with people who are struggling financially and who have health issues and you know, don't have anywhere else to turn. And that kind of makes them all of our problems, all of our responsibility. And you know, strong families are the best safety net. Another problem with our current divorce laws is they create an incentive to end a marriage that probably shouldn't be there. You know, um, many states and certainly some judges can arbitrarily assign alimony for life. So if a woman who's been married for 10 or 20 years decides that she's not happy and decides that she wants to get a divorce and she gets a really good lawyer, well, she can oblige that ex-husband or that husband of hers to pay her an income for the rest of her life. And that oftentimes will bankrupt the man. And I know there are many men on the streets living homelessly, uh, unhomed, I guess is the politically correct term, as a result of divorce settlements that literally broke them. And the emotional toll and the financial toll that takes on, on people is um, something I don't think our society recognizes very clearly. And I think it's something that if we don't get our arms around it, it's just gonna become a bigger and bigger problem. Um, yeah, so divorce laws, it's more than just about uh, you know, ending bad marriages, but we need to have a way to determine what is a bad marriage and at what point is divorce really the only solution? Is just being unhappy with your life enough to end a marriage? Because the irony is a lot of women who leave marriages because they're unhappy later learn that they were much happier in the marriage than they are after they left it. So just food for thought, you know, I think that this is one of those issues that we've got to deal with. And um, what's working now or what's happening now isn't working. I guess what I'm saying is that these are some monumental changes in our society where fewer and fewer people are choosing to get married. People can't afford to buy houses. They can't afford to have children. More and more people are getting divorced. The um, financial burden of a lot of divorce is being placed on men and fewer men are opting in to marriage for a whole bunch of reasons. So men don't wanna get married because they don't wanna get stuck with the bill of a divorce. Women don't wanna find a man that earns less money than they have. And the uh, economics of living today requires two incomes. So we're gonna end up with a lot of single mother households who can't afford to own a property and a lot of lonely single guys who can't find a partner. And then older people who happen to be married are gonna be facing a much higher rate of divorce. This just doesn't work out well for anybody. It doesn't work out for you, it doesn't work out for me. 
doesn't work out for anyone in this country. We're all going to be suffering if this continues as it is. So I don't know what the answers are, but I do know we're not going to find it if we keep doing what we're doing now. We're going to need to start having some kind of conversations about this. And we need some political leadership to step into the void and to at least get these conversations going. Because if we don't, things are just going to get worse. I know this is a very um, difficult topic and I know that there's a lot of people with some very strong opinions about it and I think that all opinions are valid here so long as you're not um, you know attacking people personally and keeping personalities out of it it's really just about can we have a conversation about these kinds of issues in a mature way that runs down the middle let's keep the extremes out of it you know it's always the extremists in our political discourse that get all the attention and it's time for us, those in the middle, who have a common sense approach to how we run this country, to speak up and be heard. Because if we don't, it's gonna be the whack jobs that run the, run the country. And that's what we're seeing. You know, we're seeing the extreme left and the extreme right take over our political discourse. And we just need to stop it because we're not making any progress at all. All right, that's all I got for you today. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please like and subscribe. And I implore you to, Get on those comments and express your opinion. You know, I want to hear all opinions. Keep it, you know, keep it civil. Keep it um, well thought out. You know, mature responses and ideas. Um, anyone that uh, you know has these extremist views on one side or the other, you know, I just don't think we have the we have the patience for you anymore. You know, so please don't bother. All right, that's all I got for you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.